Mysterious Disappearances by Ambrose Beers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. Mysterious Disappearances by Ambrose Beers. The Difficulty of Crossing a Field. One morning, in July 1854, a planter named Williamson, living six miles from Selma, Alabama, was sitting with his wife and a child on a veranda of his dwelling. Immediately in front of the house was a lawn, perhaps fifty yards in extent, between the house and public road, or, as it was called, the pike. Beyond this road lay a close-cropped pasture of some ten acres, level and without a tree, rock, or any natural or artificial object on its surface. At the time there was not even a domestic animal in the field. In another field, beyond the pasture, a dozen slaves were at work under an overseer. Throwing away the stump of a cigar, the planter rose, saying, I forgot to tell Andrew about those horses. Andrew was the overseer. Williamson strolled leisurely down the gravel walk, plucking a flower as he went, passed across the road and into the pasture, pausing a moment as he closed the gate leading into it to greet a passing neighbor, Armour Wren, who lived on an adjoining plantation. Mr. Wren was in an open carriage with his son James, a lad of thirteen. When he had driven some two hundred yards from the point of meeting, Mr. Wren said to his son, I forgot to tell Mr. Williamson about those horses. Mr. Wren had sold to Mr. Williamson some horses, which were to have been sent for that day, but for some reason, not now remembered, it would be inconvenient to deliver them until the morrow. The coachman was directed to drive back, and as the vehicle turned, Williamson was seen by all three walking leisurely across the pasture. At that moment one of the coach horses stumbled and came near falling. It had no more than fairly recovered itself when James Wren cried, "'Why, father, what has become of Mr. Williamson?' It is not the purpose of this narrative to answer that question. Mr. Wren's strange account of the matter, given under oath in the course of legal proceedings relating to the Williamson estate, here follows. My son's exclamation caused me to look toward the spot where I had seen the deceased an instant before, but he was not there, nor was he anywhere visible. I cannot say that at the moment I was greatly startled, or realized the gravity of the occurrence, though I thought it singular. My son, however, was greatly astonished, and kept repeating his question in different forms until we arrived at the gate. My black boy Sam was similarly affected, even in a greater degree, but I reckon more by my son's manner than by anything he had himself observed. This sentence in the testimony was stricken out. As we got out of the carriage at the gate of the field, and while Sam was hanging the team to the fence, Mrs. Williamson, with her child in her arms, and followed by several servants, came running down the walk in great excitement, crying, He's gone! He's gone! Oh, God, what an awful thing! And many other such exclamations, which I do not distinctly recollect. I got from them the impression that they related to something more than the mere disappearance of her husband, even if that had occurred before her eyes. Her manner was wild, but not more so, I think, than was natural under the circumstances. I have no reason to think she had at that time lost her mind. I have never since seen nor heard of Mr. Williamson. This testimony, as might have been expected, was corroborated in almost every particular by the only other eyewitness, if that is a proper term, the lad James. Mrs. Williamson had lost her reason, and the servants were, of course, not competent to testify. The boy James Wren had declared at first that he saw the disappearance, but there is nothing of this in his testimony given in court. None of the field hands working in the field to which Williamson was going had seen him at all, and the most rigorous search of the entire plantation and adjoining country failed to supply a clue. The most monstrous and grotesque fictions originating with the blacks were current in that part of the state for many years, and probably are to this day, but what has been here related is all that is certainly known of the matter. The courts decided that Williamson was dead, and his estate was distributed according to law. An Unfinished Race James Byrne Warson was a shoemaker who lived in Leamington, Warwickshire, England. He had a little shop in one of the byways leading off the road to Warwick. 
In his humble sphere he was esteemed an honest man, although like many of his class in English towns he was somewhat addicted to drink. When in liquor he would make foolish wagers. On one of these two frequent occasions he was boasting of his prowess as a pedestrian and athlete, and the outcome was a match against nature. For a stake of one sovereign he undertook to run all the way to Coventry and back, a distance of something more than forty miles. This was on the third day of September in 1873. He set out at once, the man with whom he had made the bet, whose name is not remembered, accompanied by Barham Wise, a linen draper, and Hammerson Burns, a photographer, I think, following in a light cart or wagon. For several miles Worson went on very well, at an easy gait, without apparent fatigue, for he had really great powers of endurance, and was not sufficiently intoxicated to enfeeble them. The three men in the wagon kept a short distance in the rear, giving him occasional friendly chaff or encouragement as the spirit moved them. Suddenly, in the very middle of the roadway, not a dozen yards from them, and with their eyes full upon him, the men seemed to stumble, pitched headlong forward, uttered a terrible cry, and vanished. He did not fall to the earth, he vanished before touching it. No trace of him was ever discovered. After remaining at and about the spot for some time, with aimless irresolution, the three men returned to Leamington, told their astonishing story, and were afterwards taken into custody. But they were of good standing, had always been considered truthful, were sober at the time of the occurrence, and nothing ever transpired to discredit their sworn account of their extraordinary adventure, concerning the truth of which, nevertheless, public opinion was divided throughout the United Kingdom. If they had something to conceal, their choice of means is certainly one of the most amazing ever made by sane human beings. Charles Ashmore's Trail The family of Christian Ashmore consisted of his wife, his mother, two grown daughters, and a son of sixteen years. They lived in Troy, New York, were well-to-do respectable persons, and had many friends, some of whom, reading these lines, will doubtless learn for the first time the extraordinary fate of the young man. From Troy the Ashmores moved in 1871 or 1872 to Richmond, Indiana, and a year or two later to the vicinity of Quincy, Illinois, where Mr. Ashmore bought a farm and lived on it. At some little distance from the farmhouse was a spring with a constant flow of clear, cold water, whence the family derived its supply for domestic use at all seasons. On the evening of the 9th of November in 1878, at about nine o'clock, young Charles Ashmore left the family circle about the hearth, took a tin bucket, and started toward the spring. As he did not return, his family became uneasy and going to the door by which he had left the house, his father called without receiving an answer. He then lighted a lantern, and with the eldest daughter, Martha, who insisted on accompanying him, went in search. A light snow had fallen, obliterating the path, but making the young man's trail conspicuous. Each footprint was plainly defined. After going a little more than halfway, perhaps seventy-five yards, the father, who was in advance, halted, and elevating his lantern, stood peering intently into the darkness ahead. "'What's the matter, father?' the girl asked. This was the matter. The trail of the young man had abruptly ended, and all beyond was smooth, unbroken snow. The last footprints were as conspicuous as any in the line. The very nail marks were distinctly visible. Mr. Ashmore looked upward, shading his eyes with his hat held between them and the lantern. The stars were shining. There was not a cloud in the sky. He was denied the explanation which had suggested itself. Doubtful as it would have been, a new snowfall with a limit so plainly defined. Taking a wide circuit round the ultimate tracks, so as to leave them undisturbed for further examination, the men proceeded to the spring, the girl following, weak and terrified. Neither had spoken a word of what both had observed. The spring was covered with ice, hours old. Returning to the house, they noted the appearance of the snow on both sides of the trail its entire length. No tracks led away from it. The morning light showed nothing more. Smooth, spotless, unbroken, the shallow snow lay everywhere. Four days later, the grief-stricken mother herself went to the spring for water. 
She came back and related that in passing the spot where the footprints had ended, she had heard the voice of her son and had been eagerly calling to him, wandering about the place as she had fancied the voice to be now in one direction, now in another, until she was exhausted with fatigue and emotion. Questioned as to what the voice had said, she was unable to tell, yet averred that the words were perfectly distinct. In a moment the entire family was at the place, but nothing was heard, and the voice was believed to be an hallucination caused by the mother's great anxiety and her disordered nerves. But for months afterwards, at irregular intervals of a few days, the voice was heard by the several members of the family and by others. All declared it unmistakably the voice of Charles Ashmore. All agreed that it seemed to come from a great distance, faintly, yet with entire distinctness of articulation, yet none could determine its direction, nor repeat its words. The intervals of silence grew longer and longer, the voice fainter and fainter, and by midsummer it was heard no more. If anybody knows the fate of Charles Ashmore, it is probably his mother. She is dead. Science to the Front in connection with the subject of mysterious disappearance, of which every memory is stored with abundant example, it is pertinent to note the belief of Dr. Hem of Leipzig, not by way of explanation, unless the reader may choose to take it so, but because of its intrinsic interest as a singular speculation. This distinguished scientist has expounded his views in a book entitled Verschwinden und seine Theorie, which has attracted some attention particularly, says one writer, among the followers of Hegel and mathematicians who hold to the actual existence of a so-called non-Euclidean space, that is to say, of space which has more dimensions than length, breadth, and thickness, space in which it would be possible to tie a knot in an endless cord and to turn a rubber ball inside out without a solution of its continuity, or, in other words, without breaking or cracking it. Dr. Hem believes that in the visible world there are void places, vacua, or something more, holes, as it were, through which animate and inanimate objects may fall into the invisible world and be seen and heard no more. The theory is something like this. Space is pervaded by luminiferous ether, which is a material thing, as much a substance as air or water, although almost infinitely more attenuated. All force, all forms of energy, must be propagated in this. Every process must take place in it, which takes place at all. But let us suppose that cavities exist in this otherwise universal medium, as caverns exist in the earth or cells in a Swiss cheese. In such a cavity there would be absolutely nothing. It would be such a vacuum as cannot be artificially produced, for if we pump the air from a receiver there remains the luminiferous ether. Through one of these cavities light could not pass, for there would be nothing to bear it. Sound could not come from it, nothing could be felt in it. It would not have a single one of the conditions necessary to the action of any of our senses. In such a void, in short, nothing whatever could occur. Now, in the words of the writer before quoted, the learned doctor himself nowhere puts it so concisely. A man enclosed in such a closet could neither see nor be seen, neither hear nor be heard, neither feel nor be felt, neither live nor die, for both life and death are processes which can take place only where there is force, and in empty space no force could exist. Are these the awful conditions, some will ask, under which the friends of the lost are to think of them as existing and doomed forever to exist? Boldly and imperfectly, as here stated, Dr. Hem's theory, in so far as it professes to be an adequate explanation of mysterious disappearances, is open to many obvious objections, to fewer, as he states it himself in the spacious volubility of his book. But even as expounded by its author, it does not explain, and in truth is incompatible with, some incidents of the occurrences related in these memoranda, for example, the sound of Charles Ashmore's voice. It is not my duty to indue facts and theories with affinity. End of Mysterious Disappearances